Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, this Vagnu Salon. It's actually our ninth, dating back to uh, 2008. Um, before introducing the subject, I just want to say a few words about Vagnu's. Um, besides the salon where we analyze major visual news stories in a discussion format, uh, we analyze news stories and their use in the media on a daily basis at vagnewsnotes.com. Uh, and uh, we also publish original photojournalism under the editorship of uh, the fine photographer Alan Chin. Um, as many of you know, Alan was also on the ground in Egypt and Libya for, uh, for bag news, uh, along with several other contributors, including um, David Degner, uh, who's here with us um, today. Um, and if you're not already, um, I hope you'll follow us on the web, Twitter, Facebook, and now we're on Tumblr as well. Um, so a little bit of background on today's mission. Uh, in approaching the story, we were really taken by just how much the uh, Egypt Revolution was shaped uh, or shaped up as a media battle waged in the visual public square. Um, we hope a close reading of these photos will accomplish uh, at least two things. Um, we hope it will lead to a better understanding of how the, the visual media chose to interpret the event uh, and frame it. And then we also um, uh, we, uh, we hope it will also lead to a better understanding of how the Egyptian democracy movement understood and made an alliance with the camera uh, in a perpetual war fought, uh, a perceptual war, a perceptual war fought largely on one stage in front of the international press. And I think that that trend is not going to go away. So I think that um, we're talking about something that's really, you know, we're only going to see more of. Um, and then also it's important to add that, you know, the meta – in terms of what we do at Bag News involves not just looking at images, but really doing a deep read on them. Um, uh, so welcome to our panel, and now uh, I want to turn it over to our moderator, uh, Nathan Stormer, uh, professor, of, professor of Communications and Journalism at the University of Maine. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks, Michael. What I'd like to do, first of all, is for each of the participants to just click through and say hello, uh, the, the panelists who have vocal capacities, audio capacity, so we can hear each other's voice a little bit and start to recognize one another. So you've heard Michael, uh, Paul, I'm Nathan Stormer. Uh, how about if we go with David Campbell and just down the list, just a very quick hello. Yeah, hi, uh, this is uh, David. I'm uh, at home in uh, Newcastle in England and uh, looking forward to this. I write and uh, teach about photography and multimedia, and you know, my particular concern is to think about the context of things. Hey, I'm David Degner. Um, I'm at my apartment in, in uh, downtown Cairo, just a block away from Cairo. Hello, everyone. Um, I am the Bag News Salon producer. Um, I'm here to help with the edit, um, give the edit some context. Uh, and for the purposes of the actual event itself, I'm doing a little bit of technical support. So I'll most likely be hanging out in the background. I'll also be posting the image captions um, to the chat pane. So have a look out for those. Wonderful. Uh, Laura elton Tawi. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura. I'm an Egyptian photographer based in London. I'm uh, talking to you from London at the moment. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, thank you for having me on this panel, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Lorette Steinberg. Hi, I'm Lorette Steinberg, and I'm sitting at my desk in Rochester, New York. I teach at Rochester Institute of Technology, uh, documentary studies and photojournalism uh, principally, and, and I think you know, the way that David Campbell talked about all the concerns of photographs in context certainly echo the way that I look at work. Uh, and I've, I've been working with Bag News Notes for a few years uh, as a consultant and, and look forward to becoming more involved. But I'm looking forward to the discussion. Wonderful. And Michelle? Hello. Sorry I'm late. Um, I don't know if you can hear me okay. My signal seems really low. Oh, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so I missed I missed the first part. Uh, sorry about that. But um, I'm the photo editor for Middle East Report magazine, which is based in D.C., Washington, D.C., uh, but I'm based in Beirut, uh, which is where I am talking to you from now. Wonderful. 
Uh, what I will do is start moving through the images. And for the first two, since we have the photographers here, David Digner and Laura Elton Towie, we'll have each of them start off on those images. And then when we move to the third one, I'll just generally put a prompt out there and start having people react to them. And I'll also be watching the text box. And uh, if some questions are being raised, all those who are, are sort of watching but not able to speak uh, can certainly text in there. I'll try and keep an eye on that and bring some of those questions in as well. But so our first image, and this one is from uh, David Degner. I'll post that. And then if you wouldn't mind, David, just talking a little bit about this image and um, relative, I guess, maybe to, to Michael's prompt about seeing this in the context of how the West was looking at uh, Egypt, uh, potentially, and some of those issues. Sure, sounds good. This was, this was a photo that was taken on the, the last day of the revolution, right after Mubarak stepped down in the evening. Um, I had been sent down to cover another story, a profile piece on Alexandria, the coastal city of Egypt. And um, when, the, uh, when we got the news that Mubarak stepped down, I, we were a little bit further away and went to the Corniche, and um, I just started shooting everything I could see, and um, when the uh, when I got close to the deadline, I went back up to uh, the hotel room, which this was right beside the hotel, um, luckily the celebration center, like in, uh, in Cairo, it was in Tahrir, but in, um, in Alexandria, it was kind of spread all along the Corniche, but uh, there was a large group in front of uh, our hotel, and so I uploaded maybe 10 photos, and I was really surprised next morning when I saw that uh, they used this one um, for the front. I and I've been thinking about why why it was used um, compared to the other photos that I uploaded, and I think it it has some uh, its strength is that it, it fits the Western liberal mindset of what they want the revolution to be. It's a rather non-threatening female, uh, just joyous and like having the wind blow through her hair with freedom and it takes all the complexities and all of the, um, many of the other celebration photos were of young males like shooting fire um, out of aerosol cans and these rather frightening dark images, especially in Tahrir, they all, many of them had these uh, yellow casts that made them look almost ghoulish uh, just because of the light there. And um, so this is the, the image that I think people wanted to see and I, I don't think it shows much of the complexity that uh, actually is happening or will happen in uh, in Egypt. I, I, the, 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 but I, this has all been like rattling around in my brain for a while, so I'm, I'm really interested to hear um, what reaction other people have other people have to it. Um, I was just wondering, David, if you felt like, you know, you've been getting a media education uh, through all of this. Yeah, absolutely. Even though I've been uh, working in newspapers for a while, this is a completely different level than what, I'm, what I normally work on. Usually it's long-term or uh, cultural pieces, and to be in the middle of uh, a breaking news event like this, has, it's been a real, real learning experience. I'm particularly struck by the comment you made about uh, the way that Westerners want to see the Egyptian Revolution. I mean, culturally, one of the things that I recognize uh, right away with this image is how contemporary it looks. And the whole idea, you know, it's certainly the woman with freedom, as you described, and, and wind blowing through her hair. Uh, but she looks powerful and, and certainly... Um, uh, in control of her life at that point. And I think, you know, for us, that's the way we interpret, you know, revolution or change in other countries is they all want to be like us. And I'm much more interested in some ways in your other photographs what, that you also described. The other photographs I described? Um, this was, there weren't um had nearly as many women out at the time, and there were one of the other photos that I submitted was of a uh, a family, uh, rather 
conservative looking family where the the husband had a rather long beard and the wife was in a full uh, hijab. And um, the, the kids were absolutely belting out a national song and the wind was blowing off the sea and it was, it was just as truthful of an image as this one. Uh, but everyone was wearing the um, more stereotypical uh, religious conservative uh, clothes and it was a family instead of a single woman. and. Um, it was an interesting editorial choice here, and also the photo was used um, for uh, a one of the more government mouthpiece magazines in Egypt, uh, without my permission or even asking. I don't know how they got a copy of the photo, but um, so it it has many uses. Like it can easily be applied to um, uh, many views, I think, or it's malleable. Whatever anyone wants to use it for. I think you had talked about, you know, some of the images that you made that might have been perceived as threatening to the West. You know, the, when we see people in other cultures firing guns into the air, and you mentioned something with uh, I've, I've cans with fire. Um, and did did those run anywhere? Um, I remember seeing seeing them in a few slideshows. One of the uh, Pastimes or ways, especially soccer games, take aerosol cans. You know, light the uh, uh, flame coming out of the, uh, the end of the aerosol can, and it makes these beautiful, crazy light images. But um, they're also uh, rather threatening. And I saw them in a few. In fact, uh, I believe Guy Martin shot really really tough career um, for the Wall Street Journal also, and he. He shot those images, um, but they, yeah, they weren't run big or anything. One thing to perhaps um, keep in mind looking at this edit and also, you know, thinking about or looking at a larger body of images that came out of the 18 days is, and this is something I don't think I've really seen in a major news story before, is just um, how, um, how much the uh, photos did not, in a way, focus as much on portraiture or the individual. Um, I mean, this one surely does, and like you were saying, David, you know, it really was something that's perhaps more typical of a front page of, you know, like the Wall Street Journal, but the number of photos that are really more like crowd shots or really show people in aggregate as opposed to show an individual face and really concentrate on portraiture is absolutely stunning to me, and, and I think it is reflective of what happened. I agree. Perhaps we want to contrast this image with uh, Laura's image, the tank image, to, just to see sort of two very different, I mean, very, very different kind of windows into the event. Do you want me to talk about that picture now? Oh, there we are. Yeah, Laura, when I saw this, I, I just was totally dumbstruck. Um, yeah, thank you. I was actually really dumbstruck myself. And um, for me, actually, the main reason that I went to Egypt obviously was um, as an Egyptian. I just felt like I couldn't really watch the events and be so far removed from them without actually being in them. Um, so for me, to be honest with you, I mean, photography was kind of an excuse for me to be in Egypt and in Tahrir Square during that time. And um, I had covered protests in Egypt before, like in 2005, when you had the big wave of protests that started with the Kifaya or the Enough movement. Um, I remember I, you know, I, I photographed these protests, uh, but there was definitely a very different vibe and a sense of determination that was in Tahrir Square that I don't think I had felt in the other protests. Um, I mean, even when you talk to the people in Tahrir Square, the sentiment was always, uh, we're not leaving, you know, I'd rather die on Tahrir Square than have Mubarak continue to rule the country. So for me, I was really trying to take as my focus the, um, this kind of sense of determination and persistence 
which even for me as an Egyptian, I really, really completely admired, and I was really humbled by it, and at moments even felt a bit ashamed of myself. The fact that I don't really live in Cairo, and I feel sort of in between Cairo and London. Um, so yeah, this is what I was trying to illustrate, and when I saw this moment, I was really, you know, taken back by it, and I felt this is a sense of determination that, you know, is beyond anything I could have imagined, and this man was lying there, and actually below him were also a line of people that were sleeping below the tank, and this was because there was rumors that the military was going to come in overnight and perhaps try to remove the people from the square, so they decided to sleep um, around the tank, and in this case, on the tank itself prevent it from coming in overnight. I think it very much captures that sense of, of determination. Uh, but, but, but I think also is really amazing about this is it is that kind of determination, but enacted through um, the, the, the posture uh, of what is necessarily a passive posture. Uh, and yet the determination in that is really, it's, so it's an extremely active and passive image, which I find really striking. Uh, yeah, and the sense of the, you know, the absolute discomfort. I mean, there's no way this is a comfortable position for someone to sleep. Um, and obviously he's already been beaten in the protest before. I think this picture was taken the night after the horse and, you know, what became known as the horse and camel conquest or battle on Tahrir Square. So this man was obviously um, injured in that in that episode, and yet you know he didn't give up. He's still there and he's sleeping in this really uncomfortable position because he doesn't want Mubarak to rule the country anymore. Visually, the, to me, this this appears to be uh, telling us just a level of commitment uh, that that everyone here is willing to be vulnerable and and to confront the reality of powers that are beyond them entirely. Uh, I mean, this man's being here is he is willing to be there till the end. Oh, just a side note. Uh, Michael just asked, I think it's a good comment. If when people come in with audio, if you could briefly uh, say who's speaking just so uh, to help the, the other folks recognize. Sorry. Uh, yeah, this is Michael. I I think I'm really interested actually in the like the human uh, uh, mechanism kind of hybrid here. And uh, the, when I first saw this, I was thinking, like, I guess the, the metaphor is how much the, um, the protesters sort of like uh, gummed up the works uh, in, in terms of like the Egyptian system or, or really almost like, you know, through, through a wrench in the gears. Yeah, right. I read that comment. Yeah, that's a really interesting. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting comment. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I just noticed as well, though. But but wrenches don't sacrifice themselves. So there's a mechanical kind of thing to it. But this also is an image of uh, not just in terms of the pain, but potential sacrifice uh, to obstruct. Absolutely, and I think I think that's what I was referring to. This is Lorette, by the way. I'm sorry. Um, it's it's a different picture, certainly, than the one in Tiananmen Square with the man standing in front of the tank. Uh, but it has some of the same connotations of, you know, I am willing to give up everything. Yeah, this is Laura again. Yeah, um, yeah, Lorette, absolutely. And I think that was exactly the sentiment that was in Tahrir Square among the really, like, the, the completely avid protesters that were sleeping there for the 18 days. Um, that they, they really didn't care anymore. I mean, for them, if they died, whatever happened, they really didn't care anymore. This, this was the time when change was going to happen. And if it wasn't now, then they'd rather die than sort of live another day. And for me, this, you know, it was not something that I'd ever felt in Egypt. To be honest with you, as an Egyptian, I had felt like Egyptians became completely uh, passive, and they had just, you know, sort of agreed to the situation that they were in, and they decided to live their life as it went by, myself included. Um, but then everything in Tahrir Square gave you a sense that, you know, there was something new that was about to happen or something new that's happening, and that there was definitely a new Egypt. Uh, David Campbell. Yeah, hi, David Campbell. Uh, the other little detail of this photo that's interesting is that it looks like that there's a folded flag in the top right corner. It, it may not be a flag, but the white and the red suggest that's a possibility. 
and kind of underscoring Michael's comment earlier about the lack of portraiture and, and kind of the emphasis on the mass is that even when there were individuals in a lot of the photographic work, they were often associated with flags. And you know, with the flag, of course, you've got a visual symbol inside a visual symbol about the struggle for that nation, the struggle for the people, and so on. And, and another common shot was, you know, a shot from on high, looking down on the square or on the mass, with a flag in the foreground, either you know, from someone close waving it or from a building overlooking the square. And so I'm kind of interested in the relationship of, of the flag and perhaps the detail of the flag and this image. Michelle. Um, sort of related, I just wanted to ask the photographers if they felt torn when they were photographing between, the, you know, roaming around and, and catching these images that are very uh, resonant and rich and some symbolic of, uh, of other things, that and maybe wanting to follow one person or, you know, one little in group of people through the, you know, many days to see how their, what their experience of the uh, of the square was like, as Laura was talking about their intense Feeling, and I was wondering if she was, if you were Laura, wherever, you know, uh, thinking about following, you know, in a more maybe documentary mode. It seemed to the square seemed to lend itself to that sort of uh, look, but I don't think I, I noticed any photographers really doing that sort of in-depth look on a small group. Yeah, hi, this is Laura. Yeah, um, actually, um, for me, no. I think you're right that the square did lend itself to that. But for me, in my case, I really wanted to kind of show a picture of as many people as possible and try to show in that process the cross-section also of people that were there as well. So I didn't want to focus on anyone in particular. And um, if I could just be completely honest, to be honest, I mean, when I was in the square, I was a bit overwhelmed by everything that was happening. Um, I don't feel that at the end I really did such a, you know, a good job documenting the events. I feel like for me the reward was actually you know, physically being in the square. I was completely distracted the whole time I was there between actually, you know, taking part as a protester, as an Egyptian, and taking pictures as a photographer. So I was really distracted the whole time in the square that at moments I wasn't even thinking clearly as a photographer because I was distracted by the other things. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to say something about uh, David Campbell's comment about the flag on the right. In fact, this picture doesn't really show it very well, but on the, the right, it's actually a man that's also sleeping. Um, his back is sort of leaning on that tire, and he's covering his face with that flag. So this is another man actually sleeping on the, uh, the tank. Uh, this is Nathan. Uh, you know, the, the, between David's and uh, Laura's comments just now, I think we're sort of, uh, maybe if, if it's okay to also now look at the third image, but think of it directly in connection to what you were saying about the anonymity both in this case, the specific anonymity of these two men in the tanks, and then the, the next one from Ed Oog, uh, a New York Times photograph, I think also really demonstrates that, but from the, the on high, as David would. Hopefully it will show up soon. I, I, this is my question. Oh, it's just uh, the framing of it is uh, both these images are so very, very different, but then as we were just discussing, the kind of anonymity that is is, is different, but in both of them. Uh, this, obviously, the, the the tent city and the square and uh, the discussion about like a documentary or sort of following a smaller group, but even with the, as Laura was saying, shooting the, the image of the tank, it's, it's capturing determination, but the people who are determined is also anonymized within it. Or they're completely individualized as a collective, which is something that you know we don't see too often, or we don't see in a prolonged way over the course of days. Um, so it really is, in, in a way, maybe we're looking at one collective people. Yeah, this is what, yeah, I completely agree. I think it's the kind of picture that you you must have in this situation because obviously. The number, the staggering number of people that were there in Tahrir Square, you know, it was just, it was just amazing. And uh, also considering the reports that the government was saying on state TV on the other end, saying it's only just, you know, a few thousand or whatever. I think for people to see these numbers of people that were there, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a must. 
Lorette. I, I know when we talk about context, I really see these two photographs as building on, on each other so much that in this one, well, in, in the previous one that Laura made, you know, we, we see the, the absolute commitment and, and uh, resolve of the people in the tanks, uh, in the machinery. But then we flip to this one, and although it's anonymous, it's more reassuring that there are that many people, that, that it's, everybody is together behind the, the revolution, but everybody is also individually committed to it. Uh, this is Michael. Uh, I'm curious uh, how, to what extent people really um, think about uh, or relate Either at the, we're relating at the time or relate now to Tahrir Square uh, as a stage, um, you know, all, almost maybe not in the sense of, of theater, maybe as much about protest, but but literally like the a stage where this drama played out, and it really was going to be maybe after a few days understood to be the 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 fulcrum for um, you know for for the for the outcome. Uh, and then also, well, actually, visually too, I see this not only as a stage, but it also to me is like an iris um, or like an, an eyeball, where it becomes kind of the central persona of of the of the population and the fate of the country. But uh, but I was interested in how many people relate to this specifically, and did relate to it specifically as a stage. So your question is how... This is Michelle. Oh. Go ahead, please. Oh, David, you go ahead. Oh, no, that was Nathan. I'm just, I'm just yammering. Please go ahead, Michelle. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to say that, that that kind of brings up something that I thought about a lot as I was looking at photographs to go in our next issue is that um, Tahrir really did, of course, become the, the main stage for all the events happening in Egypt. And uh, for obvious reasons, most of the photographers were there in, in Tahrir and focused on it. But I found that very difficult to find photographs from other locations, um, some more from Alexandria, but Suez uh, was somehow difficult. But also from a place like uh, Mahala al Kubra where there, have been, there were labor protests at the same time and uh, that, that were important because they refer to the, the long history of the labor strikes and organizing in Egypt that, that helped pave the way for this whole revolution. Uh, and that was not, I could find almost basically no photographs of that, except those that were taken by individuals with cell phones uh, that we couldn't publish because of resolution problems. But so anyway, the idea that this is this became the center, I think, was is is true and and but was also problematic in certain ways that it was constructed as a as a central event and to the exclusion of some of things happening all over different parts of the city and and different parts of the country. Uh, Nathan. Nathan was uh, uh, making a comment about the, the circular configuration. It was something that, that I had thought about as well. Uh, I mean, everybody always referred to it as Tahrir Square, and my not having been there, you know, I, I'm not as familiar with the geography. But visually in this, the circle and all of the people around it really builds that idea of, you know, the people at the center and everyone else there to support. And I wonder if that's, that's how it felt when you were there, this would be uh, to, to any of the photographers. Uh, uh, hi, Lorette. You were referring to the um, sort of the composition and how it almost looks like a circular and how everybody else is revolving around it. It kind of almost looks actually, you know, it reminds me of the image of the uh, the annual Muslim uh, pilgrimage at Mecca. Sort of you have the center of focus, you have the Kaaba in the middle, and you have everybody else kind of around it sort of circulating. And I think it sort of brings back that image with the mass of people on something in the middle that's the center of attention. Yeah, this is Michael. Actually, it's really interesting. I never thought about the, this uh, symbolism, but you know, now I'm thinking about the circles and, and the concentric circles in the tank shot, and how much because this was a country coming together, and there was this kind of um, 
you know, kind of perfect storm also that also we get the the, the circle in this photo. Um, it's, it's really interesting. And uh, this is David. Um, in some ways, now that I'm thinking about it, you mentioned how uh, it seemed like the circle with the support coming in from all sides, but in, in actuality, it was more like this. Um, for me, I experienced it more as this uh, this circle is the almost a campfire where as soon as you stepped out of it, it got cold and it got dangerous and frightening. And so it's like in this in this circle, you uh, I felt perfectly comfortable at all times. But as soon as I stepped out, I was uh, always on my own in in uh, new territory. Then we go ahead, Laura. No, I just wanted to follow up. I don't know. It seems like it was a comment from David Degner, but I just wanted to actually echo what he just said because absolutely, I mean, Tahrir Square and became sort of the center of warmth of the Express. And as you moved away from there and you moved beyond, you know, Tahrir Square, you really felt like you were in a bit of danger and intimidation because anything could happen once you were outside. I felt really safe the minute I went through the barriers and came into Tahrir Square. Um, it just felt like you can pull out your camera, you can talk to people, you can, you know, debate with people. But the minute you stepped out, there was, um, I felt, I felt like I was um, in fear for anything. People could, I, I hid my camera whenever I was outside the house. That, that's really interesting to hear because visually, I mean, I think when a photographer makes that photograph, it, it, it you only visually respond to all of the connotations of the circle. I mean, in, in this country in America, we have all of the the Western lore about you know circling your wagons and and then I think David mentioned something about campfire and and there are all sorts of connotations of circles and I I don't know I don't know if the uh, protesters actually decided to do a circle if that organically just uh, formed but that's the way we read the photograph. David Campbell, uh, it's Michael. What do you think about that symbolism? Well, one thing that I was thinking about was, you know, I mean, it, an event always has to have um, some visible space. You know, it was your comment, Michael, you began with about the idea of a visual public square. And in this case, you had an actual square, albeit with this circular arrangement being the, being the public space. And I was kind of interested in Two things. I mean, one to ask David and Laura about photographing in the square after a long period of time, because this is an Ed U photograph, and I read an interview he did on the Lens blog a few days later where he said it became actually quite difficult after you know, a long period of time in the square to, to think about different sorts of images, different sorts of angles, different sorts of perspectives to take. So I'd be kind of interested in, in, in their perspective on whether they found that also working in the square. Yeah, this is David Um That was always the problem. I was uh, waking up every morning trying to have an idea other than the square, trying to uh, know a story or have something else to add square. But it always, usually it ended up that I would end, as the sun was setting, I would be back in the square, partially because it's so close to um, uh, my house and the, uh, the hotel, the only place with the internet where we could transmit, that it was one way or the other, I'd be walking through the square, and um, the it became first um, very repetitive, and then near the end, when there were so many people in it, it actually became hard to get enough space, like physically enough space, between me and the people I was photographing, because I always shoot with a 35 millimeter lens. It was um, I was just crying out for a 24 or anything wider, so that I could show something more than like a nose and an eyeball because everyone was so crushed up together. Uh, yes. that, oh, go ahead, go ahead, please. No, no, please go ahead. I'll follow up when, when you're done. Uh, that was the eyeball. Move to, to the next photo in just a second. So go, please uh, finish your, your comment, Laura. Right. I was going to follow up from what David Zegner said. I, yeah, I completely agree with him. It became a little bit of, well, it was actually quite challenging on a daily basis to, and I probably wasn't there as long as David was actually there. 
But, um, yeah, it became really challenging because things in the square were pretty much the same, really. I mean, on certain days, obviously, when you had the horses and camels come, you know, there was a lot of, of drama on the square at that point, and, you you know, there was clinic, the clinic back in, in the corner where you could go and take pictures, but beyond that, it was pretty mundane. Um, I think what I noticed that was slightly changing, um, and that sort of was an idea to kind of change the way I was approaching the story was in the way that people were chanting things day after day. Um, I noticed that two days before the 11th of February, people were already chanting. Um, that the people have already toppled the regime, whereas before they were chanting, the people demand that the regime step down. So the chanting really changed. And I think the people felt like the regime was already gone and that they were basically in their last days or hours. Um, so for me, I felt like maybe I should be looking for different pictures at that point. Um, but aside from that, you know, it was pretty much the same every day. Yeah, I'm going to put the uh, I'll put the next one up and just uh, very briefly, I'm going to sort of move from four and five uh, a little bit while people are talking because I think both of these images uh, speak to that kind of the crowd shot and how the square is sort of leading to a certain constant kind of compositional problem. But then both of these images introduce some some um, difference into that visual frame in very particular ways. The Facebook image, and in this case, the group of Christian men surrounding Muslims at prayer. Yeah, I just wanted to mention something really quickly about the this shot. Um, uh, this was uh, this shot basically he hit the news media or the news wire via Twitter. Uh, so and there was maybe like four, three or four other shots that that also became, you know, very prominent, some even iconic, uh, because they came, but they came from, you know, citizen journalism and, and actually emerged into the media stream from uh, social media. So, so this one emerged probably about the, the third day of the uprising, and it was everywhere. And it was, again, it was in social media everywhere, and it was, then it hit the news wires everywhere. It shows um, Christians protecting uh, Muslims in prayer. Uh, and I mean, what's striking to me is that, that look of caution uh, implies the danger involved. Uh, at the same time that the holding hands emphasizes brotherhood and solidarity, and it, it really was a very powerful and early contradiction to uh, the fear mongering by Mubarak, and, and maybe also like in maybe the domestic press a little bit um, here that the Islamists uh, were going to be a serious threat. Um, to the democracy movement. We had a comment uh, from an observer uh, that says that this is still one of the uh, images that's being circulated among Egyptians and, and wondered if someone could comment to that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Laura, was that was that you? Yeah, I was going to say something. I, I, I think I interrupted somebody, but I'm just going to go quickly. Um, yeah, I was going to say, because also with the context, it's like what Nahid was saying in her comments here, that um, you have to remember that before that, there was the church bombing on, um, I believe it was on New Year's Eve in Alexandria, which obviously was a really big deal. So I think this picture was symbolic of sort of bringing Muslims and Christians together, um, which still remains a problem because even after the revolution, you had um, a lot of tension between Muslims and Christians. So I think it's a picture that perhaps is still heavily used as a reminder to people that, look, you know, we're, we're united, we're all Egyptians. The religion doesn't matter. Yeah. I, um, I remember seeing this on one of my friend's Facebook pages uh, pretty early on, and I didn't think too much of it at the time, um, but it does stick out, and it's still one of the uh, religious issues that surround what was happening in Tahrir and continue to happen around uh, Egypt. It sticks out, and I'm still trying to figure out like the truth of Yesterday, I spent a lot of time with... Uh, a group of Muslim Brotherhood uh, supporters in Fayoum, and we were talking about like how many 
Muslim Brotherhood supporters came to Tahrir and were among those um, helping out. And it's, um, I don't want to exaggerate or anything, but I think it was a pretty large percentage. As, uh, two days ago, there was a uh, protest against the amendments that were proposed to the Constitution. And the Muslim Brotherhood was for it, and um, it was rumored that the Christians were against it. Um, and there were maybe 300 people uh, in the square uh, three days ago. It was a really small turnout. So this, this is something that isn't shown in the photos most of the time because um, it's hard for uh, the Westernized to pick out who's Christian, who's Muslim, and uh, differences in dress. And uh, the, and even it's, there is no difference uh, a lot of the time. Um, so it's like one of these important issues that visually wasn't represented very often. I'm sort of, this is Michael again. I'm sort of wondering maybe for Michelle and, and also maybe David Campbell, if they felt like that picture really does look different than a newswire photo, um, and, and 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 actually why? Uh, it's David Campbell. Um, I I don't think it does look that different from a newswire photo, bar the obvious technical question about you know resolution and, and, and sharpness and so on. Um, I was interested in David Dignan's comment earlier about working with a 35mm lens and, and being up close to everyone's face and, and so on. And you know, you think of being in that crowd, in that location, um, and, and so on. And uh, you know, I think there are a lot of newswire photos that, that look like this. I wouldn't see, you know, beyond some of those technical things, a huge difference there. It's interesting. So I'm, I'm wondering actually if the popularity of the photo maybe came from the fact that people understood that it did come from, you know, that it is like a grassroots or it did come out of um, uh, social media as opposed to from uh, uh, a news organization. I'm, I'm putting up the Facebook this one next Michelle. just to, oh, please, just, just a second, uh, to putting up the, not that we shouldn't continue to talk about the, that one we were just talking about, but in dialogue with this image because it uh, it's naming social media within a crowd and that, uh, I mean, that was just such a part of the narrative about it. So I'm sorry, please go ahead, Michelle. Oh, that's fine. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I, I agree with David. It's not com completely different from the wire photos I've seen, but I think one thing that's different is that often wire photos, they try to include, uh, you know, details that give you clues as to, to, to what, like, who the people are or what's happening. And in that photo that was just up a moment ago, you don't see any symbols, that, like the crescent or the cross, uh, and I think I like that, that, that you don't need that for that photo. But um, I think a lot of the wire photos focused in on that, like a pe person holding a Quran next to a person holding a cross, um, which I think is um, makes the images a lot less interesting. But um, I saw that more often on the wire photos, and that, that's what makes it different for me. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I, I agree. And, you know, you see those ones, and, you know, it's, it's almost sometimes you wonder whether people have gathered people together in a way, and or, or at least they themselves was self-selected to be in front of the camera, you know, to, uh, to make that point, and you don't get that in that earlier shot. And the thing about that earlier shot, therefore, is that without those symbols, you know, it comes to have a great deal of purchase in social media, I think, not just because it's, you know, coming from, from the grassroots, as it were, but it, because it's coming with that caption that says these are Christians, or well, that explanation that these are Christians holding hands around Muslims, because without that explanation, then it, it doesn't have as its own intrinsic significance because of the lack of those symbols. That's really interesting. Yeah, this is Michelle again. Yeah, I think I think you're right. That's it, it's powerful because it's it's and, and poignant because it seems so spontaneous and real. And I think it's true. A lot of those photos I was referencing do seem very stagey, and that the people who have put themselves forward as an image, you can see that they've done that on purpose. That they're they're uh, expecting to be photographed or meaning to be photographed, and it takes a lot of the I don't know. Uh, it, it diminishes the photo in my point of view. Correct. 
Yeah, which makes it interesting to think about this one with Facebook and, you know, you've seen others where, like, Twitter was written on the side of a, of a wall, a shop with a metal um, shutter closed and so on. It, it makes me think about why people were arranging stone in the name of Facebook or writing Twitter on the wall. What was, what was the purpose of, of s signaling that so that it could be photographed, so it could be seen by the outside world? I think, that Loretta here, I'm sorry if I forget uh, to identify myself now and then. Um, I, and I think I'm picking up on, on Michael's question about um, amateur versus professional photographer. Um, I, I'm wondering if there is a level of authenticity assumed in a photograph that seems to be more amateur, slightly less aesthetically pleasing, and so on. I mean, as photographers, we all know that simply pointing the camera and, and snapping the shutter is not going to make a meaningful photograph. But I wonder if if some of what we see is that there's a different kind of trust level in some amateur photographs. Yeah, it's David Campbell. Uh, possibly. I mean, I think that um, I mean all photographs are aesthetic. The idea that the aesthetic is something in particular, and I think some photographs is a common mistake in some commentary. Um, but even if you assume that there is some sort of perverse, almost anti-aesthetic aesthetic of the, the camera phone image, like the CCTV photo that's slightly green, it gives it that sense of, of, of greater immediacy, perhaps, than, than the newswire aesthetic. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's some really interesting. Oh, I'm sorry, this is Michael. I was going to say quickly, there's some really interesting points here. You know, it'd be fun to almost like take a, a, a series of these of photos that were uh, that came into the media stream through Twitter versus you know newswire photos that are very similar, and almost start to tease out what what are the differences in terms of the aesthetic and and where do they reflect some of you know Lorette's point and 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 then I think it's. I don't know if it was Michelle or David who said that you know that you just you don't or it was Michelle. She said you don't really see identifiers in that picture in the way that uh, a newswire photographer almost instinctually, you know, almost as if there's a checklist would move the camera a little bit to like maybe catch a little piece of a flag or to you know to get a little bit of a, a protest poster. Um, so I I think it's really fascinating what what de denotes one coming from one and the other. I actually think that. Maybe people instinctively do pick up on those things, and and it's more, and it's more clear at an, instinct, at an instinctual level, maybe even to like you know younger people. Um, um, anyway, uh, along those lines, the, uh, Noel asks in the in the chat box about uh, the composition, the, these compositions in in their sequencing, the ordering of them in the edit, Michael, and and Michelle asked about some of the criteria for that, and so. We've had this discussion about um, amateur versus professional. Was that part of the the, the choosing that went into the edit? Uh, what sort of thoughts do you have on that? Well, uh, in there, we, I did want to have at least one image that did come from ground up, uh, and there was another one that we were we were debating. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot of ways to talk about how we uh, put the edit together. Um, and what themes we were going for, but we were trying to find at least one picture that came, you know, from, um, you know, from Twitter or from Facebook. I am struck about the movement across these, though, building off of that, that question, uh, and I don't think this was intentional, but I'm really, in this image in particular, relative to the previous one, which is sort of the, the, the image of Twitter, if you will, and this naming Facebook and the, the role that social media played in the, the uprising. But from the first movement, we've had cars and then tanks and then uh, the, the, the problems of technology in terms of shooting the square and the square becoming a figure. So through all these images, technology plays a really um, quite variable role in both the seeing and then the being available to be seen that I think is kind of unusual. Uh, relative to maybe what's going on now in Libya, by contrast, although they're highly, highly different situations in terms of their their um, events. Yes, yeah, Michael. Again, um, I, I was really interested in in uh, 
to Campbell's comment about this also, that, and I think it addresses what you're bringing up also, Nate, which is that this picture, this particular shot is completely fascinating to me because I don't get the context of it at all. I, I, I'm struck immediately by, I think, the importance and power of it and the resonance. But, you know, I look at this and I say, I'm thinking, you know, is Facebook, is that a noun or is it a verb? Is what I'm looking at here, is it a, is it a call to arms? Is it a recruitment poster? Is it a show of force even? I mean, I actually look at this and I see it as the people's corollary to the presence of military tanks in the square. You've got your tanks, we've got Facebook. And the fact that they made it out of rocks, the same rocks that, whether it was a day, a couple of days later or a couple of days before, you know, became, you know, projectiles. Uh, and this is, a, this is a completely vexing photo to me, actually. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how to understand it. Um, yeah, if I can comment on that, this is Laura. Um, I don't know if this is going to answer that um, that question, but I think um, you have to remember that this revolution wouldn't have happened if not for this online social media, uh, particularly Facebook um, and everything that happened afterwards, you know, through the Twitter and, and all that. So I think this, if anything, is kind of um, a show of force, like you said, where, where you said, you know, we have our Facebook, you have your military. Um, and also just the fact maybe as a show of credit that, you know, this is how we did it. Facebook is the way that we did it, and that's why we're here and we've taken over the square. Yeah, this is David Degner. Um, and also the big question mark in my head, like why, um, why Facebook was so well, it was written on many walls and um, in the square and around the square. And, uh, but actually on uh, amongst the... Uh, uh, more activist uh, politic, uh, party activist members, there was always a, a warning against calling this a Facebook revolution and that that would be like calling uh, the previous revolution a telephone revolution or a, a Pony Express revolution. Like Facebook just played a small part of the people on the ground that uh, made the difference. And um, amongst Muslim Brotherhood members, they're like, yeah, we they see their their party structure as the, the thing that uh, rallied uh, supporters into the group into Tahrir. Um and even I think that opinion has changed here lately because I've seen um, at least two different Facebook uh, two different instances of Facebook graffiti on the wall being um, one's been painted over and one's been scratched out almost violently. Yeah, I'm, I was uh, puzzled by that as well when I was in the square. I think that's really, really fascinating because it means that those party activists kind of share the same position as Malcolm Gladwell and the New Yorker and all those other people who want to um, disabuse people of the role of social media. And, and, you know, we shouldn't get into that debate because it's not social media alone. It's all these things working together, networked. Um, and, in fact, I don't think there is anyone serious who ever actually claimed that it's just a social media revolution or whatever. But as an image, it comes back to the point that Lorette made earlier about how, in relationship to the first photograph we talked about, as to how some of these images were non-threatening to the West. And it seems to me that these are some of the other non-threatening images, because it's like, it's not just about weapons or so on, it's like, oh, you know, they're on Facebook too. They find themselves in the midst of modernity, just like us now, teenagers, etc. So it seems to be another one of those connections that, that, that heads towards the non-threatening, perhaps. Yeah, it does really bring up the sort of notion of tools of resistance, you know, and ca capitalizing Facebook as a tool of resistance. But this next image um, on tanks, I think, also how resistance is uh, was was. I don't know. That Michael's made this point, and we're talking about this: the the, the role the tank play, tanks played in seeing this, um, and the way the prayer is staged on this next image, I think, is very, very fast. I shouldn't even say staged around it, but the, the sense of you know, just uh, prayer is resistance uh, next to these tanks. You know, so the multiple ways in which there was uh, contestation—it's really fascinating. 
this this also goes back to what Laura was this Lorette here. I'm sorry. Uh, goes back to Laura's photograph of of the men sleeping. Um, I mean, embracing embracing the power powerful machine of war and and death. Praying on a tank has such powerful significance. Yeah, David Campbell. I, I think these are also highly ambiguous images for the West because I think that for conservatives in the West, the idea of Muslims praying next to tanks, it's kind of unsure as to whether these guys have the tanks or whether they're containing these people and that there's a potential association between the two of them is, of course, a conservative nightmare for some. So I think these are really ambiguous images for how they get to be read in the West. Yeah, actually, this is Laura. I wanted to uh, comment on that because for me, um, I, I, I'm i really attracted to this picture because it does two things. It shows the people praying, which in one way is obviously a sense of determination, and again, over the tank, which is even more determination. But I was uh, going to say with, um, with David Campbell's comment, I wonder if it would be read as sort of an intimidation to people in the West that, you know, here they are praying, and not only are they praying, they're praying next to the tank, so they have the weapons. So what are we going to do now? You know, if this country changes and if Mubarak leaves, what's going to happen? Is the Muslim Brotherhood going to take over? You know, all these questions which Mubarak was sort of threatening, threatening the West about, that if I leave, the Muslim Brotherhood will take over. So I was wondering if this, in fact, reinforced that idea that Mubarak himself was trying to threaten the West by. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's definitely possible. You know, it, you can imagine, of course, is the most extreme example, but you can imagine Glenn Beck, Glenn Beck and the Fox News Network running this picture, uh, you know, as evidence of his conspiracy theories, you know, about the role, you know, about uh, an Islamic revolution and, and so on. Um, and at the same time, you can run an entirely different narrative with this image about the tanks being part of that circle kind of containing um, these individuals. So both things, I think, are possible. This is David Wagner. When I when I see this picture, it um, what stands out to me is how the military guys are on one side of the tanks and the uh, people praying are on the other. And it is ambiguous who's in control. Uh, are the tanks even useful in a situation like this? Uh, does the power lie on the tanks or in the masses? And um, the the, the military people aren't praying is uh, almost makes it a shows the the difference in um, uh, ideologies or the difference in uh, um, not ideologies but um, priorities for uh, both groups in the picture. Michelle Woodward notes that there's, there is one uh, military personnel praying, but what I find interesting is he's lined up. It creates a line. He could have not been in a line, and but whether he intended to or not, it creates, and he's also off to the side, sort of like he's outside but inside. So there's this little overlap, this confusion overlap, and it's, it's really quite, yeah, exactly. It's really cool. Yeah, he's right between the guy sitting in the chair, uh, holding whatever piece of paper and then that piece of plastic so by that that right back leg of the of the tank and he has to be facing the same direction though to be praying and so he's separated and he's also in unity with everybody i i, I go back this is Loretta again i'm sorry uh david degner i I think the cultural thing is is also uh, interest. I mean, we all know what Glenn Beck would do with photographs like this, but even even people who are not Glenn Beck, but people who who are just you know general people trying to understand what's going on, do you think they would get some of the the cues? How do you think that they would respond to the military? Would they notice that? Uh, uh, this is David, I've um Definitely interested in that about how um, one of the things that Alan Chin told me was like he never takes pictures of people praying because it's um, it's something that he didn't give a reason why, but I think it's something that in the West it's seen as completely different than uh, here. It's it is seen as 
threatening and uh, alien, foreign, like different, something we don't understand. At least my, my parents wouldn't understand. They, would, they wouldn't connect that to uh, someone praying in a church pew. They would see it as, uh, who are these people? Um, so it's, yeah, I'm curious. I've, I've kind of lost my uh, uh, American viewing. I've just been around it too much. I'm curious what other people still see when they when they see uh, Muslims praying. Well, I I don't know if I well I'm aware of the American attitude, pistol rat, uh, but I'd like to think that most of the people that that I'm close to would read this in the same way that probably you do or that I do. Um, but one of the things I also noticed is is there's a row of women at the bottom right, uh, I believe as far as I can tell. Um, I mean, the, the whole photograph, you can just keep walking through it and seeing more. Yeah, one thing. I mean, also another thing to, to really note, kind of in the details, is the point that it was really well made by Robert Harriman in a post on the No Caption Needed blog. You know, um, These are American tanks, and these are American-funded tanks. These are these are the manifestation of years and years of billions and billions of dollars of U.S. military aid to to the Mubarak regime, and so there, that's also in kind of an ambiguous position here. I, I was just thinking about across the ones so far. I'm going to move to the next one in just a second. Is um, one thematic that seems to be unintentionally there is the recolonizing of space. Uh, through the square, the square is, and the occupation of the square. In this case, people laying on, or I'm sorry, praying on the tanks, uh, the circles, uh, and, and also the anonymity of it. There's, and, and as you're saying, with the American tanks here, there seems to be this um, part of the resistance is simply just to reoccupy the space that is belongs to the people and saying it, it does belong to the people. That that simple gesture of protest is in some ways just a spatial one, and it shows up in a variety of ways in these, these images. And then when you see something like this next from Laura Logan, uh, the Laura Logan shot, it creates, it, it completely inverts that, right? The, the, the story of Laura Logan completely inverts that, or did for people, I think, when they were following the coverage of it. Yeah, maybe I should just say a word or two about this photo. And, and the, it, you know, I, the question earlier was about the the edit and some of the decisions that were made. Um, it just seemed like this image needed to 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 go into the a discussion, um, just uh, more instinctually. But um, you know, CBS released this photo. It was taken uh, as they, at least according to them, it was within a few minutes before she was dragged off and, um, you know, it's reported to be, have been sexually assaulted. Um, I, I have questions actually why CBS released the photo, and, and maybe it's not a question of should they or shouldn't have, they have, but, but why? Um, and, and then I, I think one reason I included it um, was because it, to the extent that we, people want to create uh, a real fairy tale around what happened in Tucker Square, and almost like then forget the couple days of you know of conflict and how much tension and fear there was. This photo, more than anything, destroys the the, the sense of fairy tale. Really says that you know there's opposition of forces. There's you know very very intense gender issues uh, uh, involved, not between like East West, but um, just between. Uh, with women in um, in, Cai in Cairo and in Egypt and and, and men. So uh, I I think it brings I think it brings up a you know a whole lot of issues. And, and, and I understand how provocative the the image is too um, as well. well. One thing too I would say is we, we, some of the comments uh, Ida, David, Lorette, and Laura were just talking, uh, continuing on in chat the discussion of the presence of American weapons. And how that seemed uh, un unemphasized or unnoticed, uh, and and so America's role in oppression, you know, 30 years of of 
the Varg's rule becomes invisible, even though the images contain the very signs of those. And then when um, Logan's story was reported, uh, how easily the reversion to um, the specter of danger, uh, uh, so that the specific issues you were just mentioning, Michael, also could not be separated from the general sense of danger and antagonism from the West uh, projected relative to uh, the Muslim world. Um, if I could, can I comment on what Michael was saying about um, sort of the picture highlighting the uh, the gender issues? Uh, can I can I get into that? Oh, of course, of course. Right. Well, I just wanted to highlight that because actually, when I heard um, or when I read and heard about Laura Logan's story, um, I was I was extremely angry to be honest with you. I was angry one because this happened on the day which would become a historical day for Egyptians. So I felt like this sort of painted the day a little bit because to the West, I think it highlighted this image that look at these barbarians, you know, look at what they did. This is supposed to be a time where they're celebrating, especially that all the events before that had shown that the people in Tahrir Square, I don't want to say were civilized, but certainly they exhibited a sense of being civilized that, you know, you wouldn't expect in a situation like that. But for me, if I'm just to focus on my personal experience in Tahrir Square, I actually felt extremely comfortable as a woman in Tahrir Square for the most part, with the exception of the last day. I think the day that um, Omar Suleiman gave the speech on behalf of Obarak saying that he quit, a lot of different kinds of people came to Tahrir Square that were not normally there. And I think before you had women that were sleeping in Tahrir Square next to men in tents, and you never had incidents like that. I mean, Egypt, you normally have a really high rate of sexual harassment against women in Egypt, but nothing to the sense of, I think, rape. And I think Laura Logan said something about, I heard a report that she was raped, other reports that she was violently assaulted. But in any case, um, I just wanted to speak about that briefly, about my experience in Tahrir Square, that it actually was. I always felt safe. I was never harassed or violated in any way, except on the last day. You had really different kinds of people that were in the square. And it did feel very intimidating to be there on that particular day. Lorette. Um, Lorette here. I, when I saw the photographs, I mean, certainly the, the episode is, is awful. And, and Laura, I was going to ask you how you felt to be there. Um, but visually, the photograph, uh, I, I was disturbed for a number of reasons, in part because of the way that Americans would look at this. Um, the reporter is an American icon. Uh, she's blonde, blue-eyed. Uh, she's wearing curls, for heaven's sakes, and she has a pastel blue jacket. And we tend to hold a particular type as being more valuable in our society or more praised. You know, it's just when something happens to somebody in our country here, we often say, "Oh, it's 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 so awful. She's so pretty." as if homely people, you know, deserve something. But but this fed into that, you know, here here we have somebody who is icon iconographically American and they have assaulted us. And yeah, Laura, that's what I was sort of uh I was thinking about with the uh, the way in which there was sort of this peaceful occupation of space and resistance and all these different ways that the, some of the other images showed us, this one image, and as you were saying, Laura, uh, you know, over and above the, the trauma experienced by her, the way that it is politically contextualized, uh, this one image can undo in people's minds uh, a great deal of the power of, of other images, in, in, including the one that you took, Laura, that we were um, showing. And that, I think, also uh, points up the, the fragility of the visual environment, that one image, which reflects something that's peculiar uh, in, in a whole event, can overtake the entire event because of its visual uh, um, contextualization or the moment at which it occurs or how it occurs. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a great point, and it, uh, Michael, again. And if you um, – and it, what it overruns also is that the – the fact that the photo, the contents of it might be a little bit more ambiguous. You know, the read in the West, and especially, the, you know, when the Fox News people get a hold of this, it's like, you know, us versus them, uh, and then the kind of heathens and, and you know, the and danger. 
But if you look at this picture, especially if you like um, cut it down the middle and you look at the like the right side, the the guy, there's a guy who's looking at the camera and he's waving the the V sign, and uh, and he seems much more of if you were gonna if you were gonna have to parse it like this, more of an innocent. And he's like, you know, victory, we won, looking at the camera. Then there's a kid um, inset on the left side who's uh, got the flag painted on his uh, his chin. And um, it's hard to know, like, you know, wh where he's looking. He may, be, he, may be, he may be interested in the fact that it's Laura Logan. Uh, but then the guy far, uh, far left, and he's more like actually there's color and black and white in this picture. You can almost break it up that way. But... He, the guy in the sweater, his hands are closed, and he's pushing back against the the guy, you know, just immediately to his right. So I don't know if you, you'd almost say maybe he's more Western or he's part of her entourage. But at the same time, you, if he's not, uh, and it's valid, just you know, at the level of looking at the imagery without knowing anything better, to say, you know, there's different sides here. There's more nuance here. This is a guy who's you know, pushing back against that more, you know, a different kind of instinct that's emerging here. So I think there's a lot more ambiguity probably would be lost, you know, in the West, but 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 it's there. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, I just, I find it a little irresponsible of them to release an image like this where she was assaulted a few minutes later because then we automatically kind of look at the men around her and think that they might be the ones who... Who did that? And I think that it could easily not be them. I mean, who, who knows? But we, I, I think there's this connection then made with these particular individuals who are very clearly seen in the image. I mean, we could see who they are. And I think I just think that I find that a very irresponsible um, con connection. And that's the flip side of the power of the anonymity we were discussing earlier. Is because the crowds were, and the story was largely, you know, of, of an uprising, of a generalized uprising, and the anonymity. But it also means an event like this against the crowd, and also because it's moments before, which creates an, a contextual um, confusion. It invites the sort of uh, recharacterizing of the whole event because of its necessary, a somewhat unknown quality of who's involved. Uh, David Campbell, did, did you think that that photo was released um, perhaps as a, a, an act of retribution? Uh, I'm not sure. An act, uh, I mean, just clarify what you mean by an act of retribution. You mean, mean by CPS? Yes. Um, no, probably not. I mean, to be honest, that story didn't get a lot of play over here. Um, it, it wasn't it wasn't a big issue. You would have to have followed particular media circles to, to have paid much attention to that. Um, it, I mean, it seems to me that it, I agree with Michelle. The thing that, that worries one about this photo is 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 the way in which it's, it's the implicit guilt of the people behind because it's being released as you know moments before. Um, whatever happened, and you know that's that's something that if this had taken place in Times Square, then this wouldn't have been released. I wonder how much anybody in the West actually understands what's going on here, except it's other and it's foreign, you know, unless unless there's a deeper caption. Yeah, Lorette, as Michael, in light of what you just said, then I'm almost hesitant to, to provide context. Um, and I'm thinking about actually the dynamic if uh, people don't have any context. Um, the photo was taken by Chris Hondros of Getty. Uh, and um, I actually had the chance to interview Chris and talk to him and ran a, a whole series of shots. Uh, this was from the morning where the um, uh, uh, the the government basically uh, had a whole group of thugs uh, rush the square and attack um, the pro, the uh, democracy demonstrators, and, but specifically uh, targeted journalists. And uh, they they went specifically for people with cameras. They were trying to break the equipment. And Chris was in just a harrowing 
uh, situation where uh, you know he he had he had to jump uh, uh, he had to avoid uh, some military guys that were trying to, to take his credentials, and then he ran right into this kind of camel attack and just and just barely escaped getting completely thrashed. So, but anyway, that's some context for what was going on. Well, knowing that, uh, it's interesting to remember one of the biggest anti-war rallies just before we started bombing uh, at, uh, Iraq uh, in New York City when the police in New York City were incredible. Uh, I can recall photographing and having to run out of the way, out of the path of galloping horses with New York City police on. Uh, and we think that things like that only happen in other countries. That reminds me of uh, Laura made the comment earlier about um, the, the Logan shot about um, the introduction of a, of a sense of barbarism, you know, and uh, so visually how that's interposed. Whereas, you know, as we were just mentioning a bit ago, the tanks don't signify that for people, uh, which probably they ought to more than a camel would, you know. Yeah, I I agree with that. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't I can't actually believe myself to be honest. Every time I look at these pictures, I don't know who came up with the idea and says let's send horses and camels to enter the square. It's kind of comical in a way, but at the same way, it's really sad to think about the mentality of who comes up with these ideas. It has to have been somebody that was with the government or somebody in parliament that decided they bring down these horses and camels all the way from the Giza pyramid, which is a really long distance away from where Tahrir Square is. And for them to travel this distance uninterrupted and just come through the streets and attack people in the square, I just still can't understand how this happens. It's, for me, it's still unbelievable. And I look at the image, I still can't believe it. Uh, Michelle and then Loretta, I think. Yeah, I found that the, this photograph really odd, and I was just wondering if anyone knows how often these, this photograph or other ones of the camel in particular uh, were used in the media, because it's, I mean, this, this moment when they came through the horse and the camel and the horses and the camel, it was, it was quick and weird, and it wasn't really indicative of the fight that with a longer battle that went on with stones and barricades and stuff between the anti-Mubarak um, protesters and the pro-Mubarak thugs. And so I find what I find so curious about it is that the, the camel has become the sort of stereotype of the Middle East, but usually in a very past, you know, Pacific kind of pleasant image. And here it's, it's violent. But I was, um, it, it's just, it, it strikes me as very odd. And I was wondering if, how many, if anyone has a sense of how much it was picked up in the, in the media. And this is Lorette here, uh, Laura especially, but anybody else too. I mean, as a Westerner, I interpret this in one way with my my particular frame, cultural frame. But Laura, would this have had a particular message to Egyptians, seeing you know people coming in on horses and camels that we would not read? Um, yeah, particularly to Egyptians, uh, I think everybody was really shocked by this. I mean, particularly people on the square, because uh, at this point, I think I, there were people getting injured left and right, and you could see that the injuries were getting sort of worse um, as this continued. Uh, you know, in the beginning, there were minor bruises, and then people started coming back to the uh, makeshift clinic on a street corner behind the square with, you know, broken bones and stuff. But I think generally... Uh, people were shocked. I don't know how people received this. Um, I think they were just completely shocked, particularly people on the square. They kind of dubbed it comically later, you know, the horse and camel conquest, and they referring to the old days, you know, back, back, back in the old times where people used swords and stuff to attack each other in, in conquest. And, um, yeah, I think for me it's uh, stupidity. I think it, it just shows how stupid this government was. And if, if this is the way they thought they were going to resolve this issue, I think it just reflects on the way they were handling the country in general. Uh, David and David. Yeah, I, I remember um, the next day seeing images from this, uh, specifically the camel, were running on the front page of most of the uh, Egyptian newspapers. It was um, comical, but also cited as a lot of people in uh, 
by a lot of people I talked with as like the turning point for them when quite a few people told me that like seeing the absurdity of camels attacking protesters that uh, that's when their mind changed and they they went in support of the protesters. Yeah, this got a lot of play in, in the British media, both on television um, and print. And I think it was seen kind of as a, a you know, theater of the absurd. I think it was, it's kind of interesting hearing um, David's remark that this, you know, turn the protesters and so on, because I think the reception here, it was also kind of a turning point for some as well, suggesting that the government was sending thugs in on camels to the square as an act of repression, then they really, really lost it. And you know, it, was, it was probably interpreted as a sign of weakness and desperation. For the, for the but one the, day, Michelle again, but the government had used a lot of violence. Go right ahead with your comment. Sorry. sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, I was just wanted to say that I, th there had already been a lot of violence perpetrated by the police and by uh, various thugs that had been sent out, and so this violence was shocking and absurd and strange. But it, then I don't, I don't know why it would. Uh, I mean, maybe it's the absurdity or the the camel that that made it more uh, compelling to a Western audience. But I find that kind of sad. Yeah, but I think that's exactly what, what did happen, because I think that kind of for a European audience, watching that protest is like, sort of expect there to be violence from the police, you kind of expect that, I mean, it happens in London, people, you know, that's kind of the story of protest, you know, that's the second part of the narrative and, and so on. So it was the fact that it was the camel that made it just seem really absurd. And I mean, I'm interested in Laura's earlier comment, it was like, who in the government thought that that was a good idea. I mean, was it some sort of weird connection between security and tourism? You know, it's like this is the symbol of the country, this will put us on the map or something. Uh, that was really strange. And I, I also just want to kind of connect this to David Degner's photos that were on Bag News about ingenuity. Um, and because they went up as kind of a response to the primitive impression of the imagery you know, from this battle in, in the square. And I mean, I. I think those photos are fantastic, and I, you know, I wish they'd got more play in terms of you know understanding a bit of the backstory to, to the struggle. Uh, this uh, last image, um, I, I, I don't want this necessarily be like a concluding frame for it, but rather uh, the way I thought maybe to, to put it was to remote what you were just saying, David, is the kind of um, temporal mashup that's that's across these images we've got and also the absurdity of, of the use of camels and but also stones to outline the image of Facebook and then tanks and then something like this where we've got you know the the internet generation and the, the sort of is wrongly probably seen as the the engine of of the unrest but although key to it so that this notion of the modern and the and the the pre-modern getting all mixed together in this in very strange and unusual ways, from the absurd to the really clever and the ingenious. Yeah, it's from camel to apple, <laughs> and uh, you know the, the the apple laptop at the center of this. But what I really like about this picture is, which is different from a lot of other stuff that kind of references social media and blogging, is the collective social nature of this moment. That there's a group here. The, you know, clearly lots of people doing lots of different things, but sort of united around things. And when you normally see a series of photographs on bloggers, and, uh, there was a series last year that got some more play. There was um, uh, Anastasia Taylor Lynn series on the Egyptian bloggers. They're always individual uh, portraits, as though these are people who are isolated and removed from sociality. They're removed from from collectives and so on. What I like about this is that is it reinserts the social media entirely into the collective and the struggle. I'm trying to read this is Lorette. 
I'm, I'm sorry. This is Lorette. I'm just trying to read. Is the shirt on the right background? Does that say something about USA? And uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for the other visual cues that Americans might read, uh, as just as they would with the tanks and the camels and so on. I'm sorry, I missed that. Oh, well, this is Lorette. It's, it's not an important point, but I'm, I'm trying to read the shirts and uh, where they come from. Yeah, this is Michael. The, the shirt, I mean, I think it's hard to get past the the Apple logo as being, you know, and, and then that, I think that brings a lot of America into it. There's a lot of, there's a bunch of Coca-Cola there. Um, and then once you get to the level, once you start talking about the shirts, which are fairly obscure, um, I don't know if the imagery is nearly as powerful anymore. Uh, the one guy's shirt on the, uh, says Premier, and then there is a shirt that it may say USA. There's an F and an A. I'm not sure. There's, 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 I don't know. There's a picture of someone's face on there. Uh, in terms of elements, also, I thought what was, uh, um, uh, I guess, satisfying was the fact that this is. It's not balanced out in terms of numbers from a gender standpoint. I think there's probably two men for every woman in the photo, but in terms of the symmetry of it. There's a woman right to the left of the guy at the computer, and then the woman at the far right, uh, and she's she's on a computer. So it's like a man and a woman on a computer, uh, and then she's also like got a cigarette in her mouth, and it looks like and she's got another one in her right hand, which just seems, you know, very. Um, I'm not sure. It just it, it demonstrates a lot of attitude, if anything. The toilet paper in the middle is just kind of an odd, funny element, I think. Yeah. This is Laura. Um, I just wanted to uh, to follow on uh, what Lorette was saying. I think, um, in my opinion, um, I think if people were to see this in the West, they would probably relate to it a bit more than the picture of the people praying next to the tanks. I think the picture next to the tanks may alienate people a little bit, you know, and intimidate them perhaps, whereas this one would kind of draw them in because they can associate with almost everything in the picture, you know, the way that the people look, you know, the funky hair. So there's a lot of Western elements that are so, you know, dominant in this picture. And I think if people would relate to them, they would kind of understand these people and kind of relate to what they're trying to do, whereas the other one would, um, yeah, alienate them. I don't know if it's a detail that uh, many people pick up on, but it's uh, I love it how there's the cigarettes and how one person is helping another person light their cigarette, and the girl on the computer obviously has it in her mouth and she's getting ready to pass it to someone else. It's like showing the the social and the sharing network in such a, a visceral way, especially for people that smoke. And I love that little detail. Yeah, the guy far right is helping the other guy light a cigarette, isn't he? Yeah, and that's especially um, here in Cairo because so many people smoke. It's such a common thing to ask, do you have a light or can I bum a cigarette? And um, it's universal, I guess, across countries. And relative to the comment about alienation, too, uh, versus a Western audience seeing this, if both of these images, this one and the praying uh, in and around the tanks, are images of resistance in different ways, one's a much more consumable image of resistance. In some ways, this one very only weakly signifies resistance versus that other one. And so, um, you know, how do people visually want to see uh, their uprising? You know, <laughs> how do they want to look at it? One of the things, this is Lorette again, I'm sorry, I was 
we had an internet problem here, uh, but I'm back. Um, uh, there, there was an interesting article, can't recall where it was right now, maybe one of you will, um, about uh, the youth, meaning people up into their 30s, who really helped this resistance, were very media savvy, actually even uh, helped make sure that people could make photographs and then move them to the wire services, uh, had people stationed to uh, transmit or rather transfer uh, 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 things like compact flashcards and stuff like that. And I was wondering if the photographers could talk about that because apparently some of the stories have said that uh, a group of people like this uh, was very, very smart in terms of Having having things that the Western media would respond to, orchestrating things. This is David. I um, actually didn't see that as much here in Egypt. Um, maybe I just was doing other things. But that is actually what surprised me most uh, while in Libya, that um, the they set up someone. I still don't know who set up a. Uh, a transmission point in the right beside the main square in Benghazi, and it was a hub for so many journalists that didn't have internet access. And then there were um, also seemed like all of the more liberal-minded, English-speaking, uh, accessible to the Western audience people would stay around that hub and would be uh, helping uh, filter in uh, the the videos that were. Um, showing violence in these far off cities that the journalists had to get to, and photos. And um, there are some extremely savvy and um, journalistically um, helpful uh, people out there. We're uh, we're over time at this point. People can certainly continue to to converse, but I want to give everyone a chance to uh, sign off if if that's what they would like to do. Well, I, uh, yeah, I will have, have to go in a few minutes, but it's been fantastic and incredible discussion. Thank you. Well, I wanted to thank everyone for being here, taking the time, uh, and uh, you know, hopefully we can do this um, again, do it again soon. Uh, with Ida on board, uh, we're hoping to be uh, more regular and consistent in, ter in terms of looking at large stories. Certainly, what's going on in Japan uh, is something that's going to be food for a lot of uh, thought and discussion the way that uh, is being framed. So thank you so much for participating. Really, really appreciate it and hope to see you uh, at Bag News and the discussion threads over there. Yeah, just on behalf of OpenEye, uh, thank you to Michael and the Bag News team for organizing this and Ida and a great, great, great discussion. Again, I think the depth of analysis and the, the real interaction with images was fantastic. So thank you all very, very much for coming. I'm just going to switch off the archive now, but uh, a video version of this will be available in about a week's time, probably by the time we've downloaded it, put the captions on and got it uploaded again to Vimeo. But again, thank you all very, very much and a great session. Thank you.